Hi everyone. Uh, this week's video is going to be covering two main topics. Uh, the first is going to be non-uniform rotation and how forces work in that scenario. And the second one is we're going to be covering constrained acceleration problems, which is going to have particular bearing on your homework. So I'm going to do a couple examples and setups in that case. In this particular video uh, series, I'm going to recommend that you actually go through and see if there are also important examples in the supplemental examples video. Uh, those will give you a lot of help for going through homework and related problems uh, here. So hopefully this video will be a little shorter so you have some time to take in some examples. Um, and so uh, what we have in the case of non-circular motion, we know I want to consider an object on a circular path, but not at a constant speed. Uh, since it's on a circular path, we know that the acceleration in the tangent direction must have a magnitude of v squared over r. And if I'm going to stay on that, the forces in the system must change to make this true. So I want to consider a roller coaster. So this is illustrating the best part of an amusement park, which is the loop-the-loop -loop on the roller coaster, which is allows this roller coaster to not be strongly attached to the track, but it's going to basically shoot up over the loop-to-loop -loop and go down based solely on the forces and the requirement to stay on that circular track. This is the case of non-circular motion. So if we think about that roller coaster on the surface of the track, I have a couple of forces acting on it. I have a normal force as the track pushes on the roller coaster and keeps it going uh, in the direction, accelerating towards the center circle. I also have a weight. And so this gives me the two forces that are creating tangential and normal accelerations. I know that the normal acceleration is going to produce the centripetal acceleration and will always lead to a centripetal acceleration of v squared over r, uh, but my t, a t, can be anything I want. So it has a tangential acceleration, uh, a t, and in this case, mg would be providing a component of that tangential acceleration and sort of speeding the object up as it moves down here. I want to consider the loop-the-loop in the context of what's happening here at the top. So this is the critical point. At this case, there is a normal force uh, from the loop pushing downward, creating an acceleration along with the weight. And so what I'd like to know is what is the normal force on the roller coaster if it's going around and it has these properties and we have G is 10 meters per second squared. And so if I consider that in a uh, sort of F equals MA case, I know that there are these two forces. I have a normal force in MG, and I know pointing in this direction, there's a tangential acceleration, and it must have a magnitude of V squared over, well, I call it a lowercase r, r in this problem. So uh, if I have these two cases, then I know that the normal force plus MG, I'm going to pick this in the sum of the forces in the tangential direction. Uh, sorry, these are normal accelerations. I've done it again. This is a normal acceleration. And I know the forces in the normal direction are n plus mg, and that must equal to the mass times the acceleration, m times v squared over r. So we know it must have that acceleration if it's on a circular track. And then in this case, I can just say that the normal force is then just m uh, v squared over r minus mg. That's it. I can just solve those two forces, provide the centripetal acceleration. We know one of them is the weight. Solve for the other one. So, so let's just plug in some numbers. The normal force is then equal to the mass of the roller coaster, which is 200 kilograms. Uh, times v squared, which is 10 meters per second quantity squared, all over the radius, which is 5 meters, minus mg, which is 200 kilograms, times 10 meters per second squared. Um, this latter part goes to 2,000 newtons. 
This former part is 200 times 10 squared, so that's 20,000 over 5. That part goes to 4,000 newtons. And so the difference of forces is our answer. That's 2,000 newtons. 4,000 minus 2,000 is 2,000. Solved. What if the radius was 20 meters instead of 5? In that case, the normal force would just be mv squared over r minus mg, just like in the previous. And so that's 200 kilograms times v squared, 10 meters per second squared, all over, here's where we stick in our 20 meters, minus the 2,000 newtons from mg. Well, that's 20,000 over 20. And so this expression here goes to... 1,000 newtons. And so the normal force is negative 1,000 newtons. And that's a problem. Because the normal forces only provide forces normal to the direction of the acceleration. The normal forces only act in the uh, direction pointing downward. This is saying that the normal force must be pointing upward in order for this uh, acceleration to stay on the track. And that means that either the track is sticky or the roller coaster has fallen off the track and destroyed uh, the people on board, which is a sad day, but an important lesson for physicists. So that leaves, it brings us to our uh, basic conclusion that the normal force is whatever is required to provide that centripetal acceleration. And if it can't provide it, then roller coaster falls off track. Okay. I've kind of reached the end of the main points that I wanted to cover, but I wanted to go over a few examples in uh, the time that remains me. I got three sort of sentinel examples, but the core content of this is done. Um, the first example that I want to cover is the egg ninja. So if we imagine that the egg ninja is right here and is suspended by a massless cable that goes up through a hole in a table and is attached to a little block of jello that's sliding around on this frictionless table, uh, like that. I'm going to ask, how fast does that jello have to be moving so that the egg ninja is not falling? Well, uh, important physics questions, right? Uh, so the first thing is that I want to consider the free body diagrams of the objects. So uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to consider a top-down view of the jello. I might say, well, what are the forces on the jello? Top down jello. There is a tension in the string and it's pulling it towards the center of the circle. T. And we're done. There's a normal force pushing up from the table. Uh, there's an MG pulling down, keeps it in the table. I'm not going to worry about it. But the top down, there's one force. That's T. And I know that T must be providing the centripetal acceleration towards the center of the circle, v squared over r times the mass of the jello. Cool. The free body diagram for the ninja egg has a tension force pulling up, has an mg uh, or me times g pulling down. So I have bats in equilibrium. So the sum of the forces there is zero because it's in equilibrium and that's t minus mg so that tells us that the tension force is equal to m e g and so then i can take this expression substitute it up here for the tension and solve for v and i will about just pop over to this corner of the blank page and do that so it says that m e g is equal to m j times v squared over r. I solve for v squared, and that is rg times the mass of the egg over the mass of the jello, and then I take the square root and I get my answer. So that's root rg times mass egg over mass jello. And that's what keeps the egg ninja from falling down. Okay. The important point here is that you just have one force acting on the jello. That's the tension for in the horizontal direction. That's the tension force. It just keeps it uh, pulling in towards the center. It provides the centripetal acceleration. 
problem solved. It's just required to do that to keep everything in equilibrium. Okay. Uh, the last thing we want to talk about in this video is setting up a couple of examples to demonstrate constrained accelerations. This is going to be particularly interesting because the first example is closely related to something in your homework. So let's get right to it. Uh, the example in question is this. It shows a block of mass M1 resting on a ramp and the ramp is inclined to the horizontal at an angle of theta. The ramp has mass m2 and is free to slide along the ground. So unlike last week, we're going to let the mass m2, this ramp here, be able to move in a given direction. And the sense of this is going to be that m1 is going to slide down the ramp under the effects of gravity, and the effect of that is going to push m2 that way. So if you don't believe me, let's take a look at some free body diagrams in this scenario. In this case, M1 is going to have a mass M1 G, gravity is going to point, uh, pull it down, and it's going to have a contact force between M1 and M2. Normally, we would just write this as a normal force, but because it is a force that's involved in the system, or the second object that's doing this is in the system, we're going to want to keep track of its action-reaction pairs. So we're going to go ahead and set up a force of block two on, on ramp two on block one. And those are the only forces, no friction, no tension, nothing. So this is mass one. Uh, mass two is going to just have the form. Uh, it's going to have its own M2G. The floor is going to be pushing upward with some normal force. And then over here, we wrote that there was a uh, contact force, F21. And so there has to be an equal and opposite contact force pushing downward, F12. And these are the accelerations in the system, and you'll notice that there is an X component to that F12 that's going to slide the mass 2 uh, to the side. Everything's great, but we need to understand the accelerations. And so here's a case where the forces are simple, but the accelerations aren't easy, because if M1 starts to slide down in this direction, and M2 starts to slide to the side, we're suddenly having M1 living in an accelerating reference frame. We can't do that. So what we're going to do instead is we are going to set up a coordinate reference line here. And we're going to analyze this problem in an inertial reference frame. And what we want to do then is to consider a vector here that goes from the inertial reference frame. Uh, let's see if I can get that. There we are. Uh, there, and that vector is going to have, uh, we'll give it a name, we're going to call that x2, and we're going to carry it along as a vector. And then we're going to consider a second vector that's going to run down the ramp from where x2 makes contact to the position of m1. And so when we do that, we're going to pop this vector in here. I'm going to thicken up the line so you can see it. And it's just going to run down like that. And I'm going to call that vector t. So I'm going to call that t because it's tangential to the ramp. So in the sense of normal and tangential coordinates. And uh, given all of this, the position of ramp two, of the ramp R2 as the vector relative to some coordinate origin here uh, is going to have the vector magnitude x2. So far, so good. But then the vector uh, to one, this is a vector sum. So since we have a vector, what we can do is consider that as the vector sum. First we go to the tip of the ramp and then we come down. And so that R1 is going to have the form X2 plus T. And the neat thing about this is that uh, if we analyze the forces in the inertial reference frame looking inward, these two position vectors are going to relate to the accelerations of the blocks. And I'm going to figure out those accelerations by taking two time derivatives of the first vector, uh, and that's just x2, and that's actually going to have uh, a form that's going to have some acceleration of the ramp 
uh, at mass 2 in the x direction. I'm going to call that i hat. So I'm implicitly setting up my coordinates like this, i hat and j hat. But it's constrained to move along the ground. And so the vertical direction of this uh, vector there isn't going to change at all. And so I can actually say that it has a zero magnitude y acceleration. This is not the same case for uh, vector r1, dt squared. That is going to have, if I take two dime derivatives of that, d squared, uh, it, and I take two time derivatives of this expression over here, I end up with uh, d squared of x2 vector plus t vector dt squared. And that's as a linear operator, so we consider the two accelerations uh, separately. And you'll notice that x2, uh, when I take two time derivatives of that, I just get that a sub 2x again, a 2x in the i hat direction. That came from taking the time derivative. So it's basically taking into account the acceleration of the ramp underneath block mass m1. So whatever it is, that's the acceleration. Uh, and so if the ramp slides to the side, this term here is going to take care of it. The next term is going to be the derivative of the tangent uh, acceleration. And so that's going to have a magnitude a sub t. So I'm going to say that the magnitude is changing with magnitude a sub t. And it's going to have a uh, tangential uh, acceleration in the x direction that's going to be uh, cosine theta. So it's going to be a t cos theta in the i hat direction. And then it's going to have a minus a t uh, sine theta in the j hat direction. And so that's taking into account this component of the acceleration vector where we've used that these are alternate interior angles and this is a parallel line up here so that's theta and so this is going to be uh, the sine theta is going to give us the vertical component and the cos theta is going to give us the horizontal component of that vector. I'm going to take two time derivatives and I'm going to end up with the tangential accelerations. So we have now set up a scenario where we have a bunch of forces and a bunch of positions. So when we analyze the free body diagrams up here, we can project these into the coordinate systems for these accelerations. So we know what the acceleration of block uh, two and block one or ramp two and block one are going to be. So this is a two for ramp two and block one. Unlike our typical case where we analyze in uh, the ramp in the normal tangential components, we want to stick in the xy frame of the entire analysis here. And so that means when I'm doing my free body diagrams, I'm going to want to project the forces into the xy coordinate systems. So when you do that, you're going to find that you'll end up with uh, four equations in uh, four unknowns, and you'll be able to figure out what the forces are, uh, you'll be able to figure out what the accelerations are, and this is going to give us a nice system of equations here that's going to be all tied together by these constrained accelerations. Really, the key insight was doing that acceleration. Okay, since it's a homework problem, I'm going to stop here and uh, let you take it from there. We can ask any questions that you like on the Discord. But our next step is going to be take something slightly more complicated and look at that. And this will unlock some of the ways that we want to approach the extra credit problems. We're going to take the similar scenario. And what we're going to change up here is we're going to attach block M1 over a pulley to the uh, block M2, and then the ramp is going to have a mass M3. So once again, we're going to set up a scenario where we have a coordinate axis uh, set up as zero. Uh, so we're going to set a coordinate point there, and then we're going to measure the separation from that point over, and we're going to call that the vector x3 uh, there, x3. And then I'm going to do a similar measurement. Uh, I'm going to bring the vector down the cable yeah, there. And that vector there, 
uh, yeah. I'm going to call uh, vector t. And then I also have to consider the position of mass m2. And so I'm going to consider it in terms of a vector from the pulley heading down to it. And it is going to have a vector of, we'll give that the vector s. And so the position of uh, the position of block one is going to be x3 vector plus t vector. That's just going across here. So x3 plus t will get me to that coordinate. The vector r2 is just going to be x3 plus s. Notice we've measured s downward here, so that's going to give us that piece. And then we're going to have just the position of r3 is going to just be the position of this x3 coordinate system. Then if we want to figure out the accelerations, we're going to use a kind of similar approach here to what we did last time. Uh, again, we will find that the acceleration of ramp of... Uh, the ramp is going to be ax3, so two time derivatives of this, is just going to get whatever the acceleration in the horizontal direction is, uh, i hat, and then we're going to have a zero j hat. So that's the easy one. I always like to start with that. For r1, we're going to get the acceleration vector for 1, and this is going to have the same acceleration setup. We have to take into account the fact that the ramp and the pulley moves, and that's going to give us uh, the same setup that we had last time, where we had ax3 i hat, which is the position of where the ramp is, and then we will have an a uh, t times cos theta i hat plus, oops, sorry, minus because it's going to be measured downward, minus a t uh, sine theta j hat. Finally, uh, the block here, uh, m2, uh, that we're considering, that's going to be moving up and down in the vertical direction. And given the way we've set it up, we've set up a coordinate system where x3 goes horizontally and then s goes down. And we need that to actually arrive at the mass m2. So then we're going to set up that a sub 2 is going to be uh, have magnitude ax3 i hat, because that's the x3 component. And then it's going to be minus a sub s uh, j hat. So as we've defined the vector, it's going to be going downward. So it picks up a minus sign when we project it into our i, j coordinate system. So the final thing that we're going to worry about is that this is a rope connecting these two blocks. And if, M2, if F1 slides down the ramp, M2 must go up. And similarly, if M2 drops, then M1 must go up the ramp this way. They're constrained together. And so we know that the magnitude of the S vector plus the magnitude of the T vector, those are going to have a constant length L. And so when we take two time derivatives of that, whatever S and T happen to be, we will find that uh, A sub S is going to uh, plus a sub t is going to be zero. And so we're going to end up with the magnitude of the a s acceleration is going to be a minus a t. And this is more of a constraint of the acceleration. We're going to have to pay attention to directions. And we've done that up here. So I just want to emphasize that the magnitude of a s is equal to the magnitude of a t. So one slides up, one accelerates up, one accelerates down. That's set by the constraint of the rope. Okay, so this sets up uh, the accelerations in the problem and the coordinates. Let's actually think about the forces because there's a little bit of a subtlety here once we bring this pulley into the problem. So let's consider our uh, free body diagrams for uh, this scenario. And in this case, we're going to have uh, block uh, M1 is the one on the ramp. So one is on the ramp. And in this case, the block that's on the ramp is going to have its gravity, pulling it down. 
M1G. It's going to have a contact force between the ramp, 3, 1. Uh, ramp is Bach 3, or mass 3, uh, on mass 1. So there's going to be a contact force. And then there's going to be a tension force, T, pulling it up the ramp. So it's going to give us our uh, three forces on that. In case of mass 2, it's going to have its own gravity, m2. This is the suspended mass pulling it down, m2g. It's going to have a tension force uh, pulling it up. And then the problem states that uh, m2 is in contact with the ramp. And what that means is that we have to take into account that there is a contact force between the ramp. Oops. Make that a little straighter. Uh, the ramp has a force acting on it. Uh, so ramp object three pushes on object two and it has to be pushing away from the surface. So that sets up that free body diagram. And then for three, we have a few subtleties. So it has um, the mass of the ramp uh, pulling down, M3G. There is a tension, uh, sorry, a normal force pushing up. We have all of those Newton third law forces. So we know that there has to be F of two, three, because there's an F of three, two over here. And then there has to be an F three, one kind of going down like this F three, one, because there's a contact force up here. And normally we would be like, okay, everything is good, but the pulley in this scenario up here is attached to mass three. And so these tension forces that pull the block M1 up the ramp, so there's a tension force there and a tension force there, those, those strings are pulling on the pulley down like that and down like that. The pulley is attached to block M3. So we have additional forces coming in here. We have the tension force from the pulley uh, sort of pulling downward on the suspended mass. So that's going to create a tension force there, T. And then we have a tension force that's pulling the block uh, up, uh, uh, block M1 up the ramp. So it has a tension force T that goes down like that. Whew, that's a lot of forces. So when we set up our coordinates, again, we would probably want to set this up in ij coordinates because that's where we're sort of demarcating all the reference frames uh, here and then we'll decompose all of these forces into the x's and y directions we'll use the constraints on the accelerations that we've developed here and we'll end up with a large system solvable but large system if we we're going to do this problem good news we're not i just wanted to set this up the key point here was to highlight uh, these accelerations, and how if we just construct vectors, we can write down uh, related accelerations. And anytime you have ropes here, the magnitudes of the acceleration of the connected objects are going to be linked, much like they were last week with the cows and the pulleys and all that. So the final thing to say here is that we don't normally need all of these forces here, but if you're trying to crack the extra credit problem, uh, that involves uh, sort of a pulley and some blocks moving around, you're going to want to take into account these extra tension forces here. That's kind of the subtlety that uh, exists in that project, in that problem. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say here about uh, the ideas in advanced dynamics. We've sort of done non-circular motion and we've covered uh, this uh, kind of peculiar uh, constrained acceleration cases uh, for a ramp when that ramp is free to move, and that should give us enough to get going. Uh, good luck, I'll see you in class.